first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, Serene Risk uh, for inviting me out here today. It's, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, my name is Ryan Duquette, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, law enforcement challenges in investigating cybercrime. Just a little bit about me before I start. Um, I was a police officer for about 15 years, most of that time working in the Technological Crimes Unit for about seven years at the end of my career. Um, I now run a, a, a private company and we do digital forensic investigations, uh, cyber security and, and cyber training. So this talk today is based on my experiences both as a police officer for many years and now uh, running my own company uh, within this field. Back in uh, 2007 uh, when I was working in the Technological Crimes Unit, our mandate at that time was mainly to do forensic examinations upon seized devices, computers, cell phones, to locate data of potentially uh, evidence value. I was sitting at my desk and I received a phone call from a local university in our area. And at that time, they were being the victim of a DDoS attack. For those that don't know what a DDoS attack is, it's a denial of service attack. And in essence, it is you know, your network being flooded with traffic from somewhere else which shuts everything down. And they were panicking. They didn't know what to do. Everything was shut down. Well, I was used to looking at devices to find evidentiary value. I didn't really know what to do. So it was a phone call that I wasn't sure how to handle as a police officer. They were looking to me for help, and I didn't have the answers for them because I wasn't trained in that area. We were able to help them out a little bit, but probably not to the extent that they wanted. Now, you might say, OK, well, what's the big deal? It's a, it's a little DDoS attack. Well, in October 2016, there was an attack on DIN. And DIN is a routing station for all of your internet traffic. Do you remember the old movies where you know, somebody would make a phone call, and they would take the cable, and they would pull it out of one, they'd put it in the other, and your call would be routed somewhere else? DIN is very similar to that. It reroutes all your internet traffic. Well, in 2016, October, there was an attack on DIN, a DDoS attack, which in essence shut it down for a period of time. Now you think, okay, they shut down this area, but that attack also shut down numerous sites, including Airbnb, Amazon, Boston Globe, CNN, Fox News, Netflix, New York Times, PayPal, Spotify, Twitter, and more. Now, has anybody heard of any of those? Yeah, of course. Now, the scary thing is about this attack is it not only shut down some of those services, but it shut down communication channels. People now go to Twitter to see what's going on in the world. And when other uh, areas, other websites start, start to shut down and they go to Twitter to find out what's happening and it's shut down, that's where panic starts to set in. Okay, so it was a little scary. And in this attack, there was um, IoT devices, and we're going to talk about that in a little while, that had been compromised. Uh, by malicious parties. They had the default username and passwords, and they were able to take control of lots of these, about a million um, of these devices uh, as a botnet in order to launch this attack. There is another one that is forming right now, another botnet. It is called Reaper. And right now, there are currently over 2 million devices that are already affected. Now, it hasn't been deployed to do anything yet, but experts in the field are seeing this botnet build. And they're also saying that it has the um, capacity, it's a cyber storm that has the capacity to take down the internet. So it's very scary when, when we start to see these botnets being built. So about 10 years later, in 2017, on May 12th, at approximately 11.16 a.m. Eastern Time, a police officer, oh, we can't quite see it very well, there's a map there, and we'll get the video playing. A police officer in the UK received a call regarding a ransomware attack on one of their systems. And about a minute later, a police officer in New York City received a very similar call. And about 30 seconds later, another police agency in Seattle received the exact same call. Uh, can I play the video? Whoop. Sorry, trying to play the video here. Is it not playing? Whoop. There we go. So within the next seven hours, we all watched the largest cyber attack in history in real time as it spread to over 150 countries and affected tens of thousands of victims. So my question to you is what would you have done if you received that call? How would you have helped these victims? By the time you could react, this attack had already spread globally and it was very, very hard to investigate. And that's just a few hours showing the, the victimization. So my talk today is really based on 
um, not large uh, federal agencies. Um, you know, the FBI has a very an excellent cybersecurity or, or cyber team, uh, the RCMP as well. I'm more talking a little bit more about you know smaller municipal provincial uh, bodies. Here are some of the common you know cyber crimes uh, that that policing agencies. Um, investigate identity theft, internet fraud, child pornography is a large one, um, and cyberbullying is one as well. And I think law enforcement agencies are doing a pretty good job on this, a fantastic job. There's obviously some hurdles involved. But the other two that um, I want to talk about as well is uh, computer and network intrusions, hacking, and ransomware. So it's my understanding that a lot of the provincial and municipal forces now have dedicated cyber units. Um, not technological crime units, it's a different unit in itself. And one of their main focuses is open source intelligence gathering. And open source is, you know, gathering intelligence from publicly available sources. Sometimes their focus is not on full incident, uh, cyber incident response or investigations. So I want to draw in a little bit of an analogy for you uh, for hacking, intrusions. Um, to sort of talk about it. So I want you to picture, you know, your typical break and enter that a police officer would investigate. You know, they go, they talk to the victim, they say, what was the point of entry? It was the front door. Where did the perpetrators go? They went to various rooms. When did it happen? Last night, when we were away. And what's the value of the damage and value stolen? And they hand you a number. Fantastic. You can do up your report, you can start an investigation. If we compare that to computer and network intrusions, which in essence is kind of the same thing, the point of entry, we have no clue. We don't know where they got in. Where did they go when they got in there? Don't know. Yeah, we're not sure. That's what we need you to investigate. When did it happen? Uh, we're not sure. But the average is about 206 days before a company gets breached and before they find out about it. But they don't know when they got in. And the damage and the value stolen? Not sure. We don't know yet. It's our intellectual property or other you know, identifying information for our customers. We don't know the value of that. Now, unfortunately, many breaches to organizations also, also result in further victimization to individuals. You know, we look at all the large breaches of credit card data, um, and identity theft and fraud is obviously a main concern, Equifax being the largest one right now. There's a lot of concern about identity theft. Let's talk a little bit about ransomware. So for a victim, your average ransom right now is around $1,000. And if you were to take that compared to other uh, investigations that a lot of the agencies, law enforcement agencies investigate, a fraud, for example, a $1,000 fraud would probably be on the lower end of priorities. It might take a little while for them to start that investigation. Well, ransomware is the same. It's very low payout for, for a lot of agencies. But let's take a look at some stats in relation to the perpetrators of this. Currently, there are around 6,300 dark web marketplaces that are selling ransomware. There's about 45,000 ransomware products, and it averages around $10.50 for those products. You can buy ransomware that you can launch an attack for about $10. It's very inexpensive. There's about $6 million in ransomware sales, and that equates to about a billion dollars in ransomware payout. So that $1,000 ransom for one victim turns into a billion dollars last year alone. And that's for organizations only. We're not talking at the individual's level as well. And some people out there are making over $100,000 just selling ransomware. It's a lot of money to sell these products that people can then go use to victimize others. So I think law enforcement needs to have a common theme for the public when they talk about ransomware. Back in 2015, uh, the FBI said that uh, you should pay ransomware. It's easier to pay it than it is to try to decrypt your drive. So just pay it. In 2016, they said, don't pay it. You know, don't pay that ransomware. Uh, well, there's other things that you can do to try to get that, that information back. So I think there needs to be a common theme throughout all law enforcement when dealing with this. It's also very easy these days for somebody to hide their tracks. There are VPN. Uh, programs out there that are free, that you can you know, mask your IP, you can bounce your IP all over the world, and a lot of police investigations involve trying to trace somebody down to an IP address and then go to a service provider and who, find out who is using that. It's very, very simple. And the challenge becomes with a lot of these uh, IPs and doing these IP addresses is sometimes it can lead to the wrong place. This is actually an investigation where there was a threats being made to a law enforcement agency uh, from a house. 
So the uh, tactical team obviously raided the house, and as you can see here, they're throwing flash grenades into the house and smashing the front door. Um, and I can tell you, as an officer, we actually, we didn't smash in the front door, but we went to the wrong house on numerous occasions because of IP addresses. Um, and going to the wrong house is never a good thing, especially when it's the tactical team uh, going in. So you can see here that they actually find a, I think she was 12 or 13 year old girl who was living with her 86 year old grandmother in this house. And somebody was using their, their, uh, their Wi-Fi from next door or a few houses down the street. So I think there needs to be a lot more effort in actually confirming that IP is to that house. Encryption. Just a few days ago, um, the FBI director said that last year alone, the FBI tried and failed to unlock 7,000 encrypted devices. So encryption is going to continue to be an issue and a challenge for law enforcement. Um, and it's something that they're obviously working the FBI uh, and Apple um, issue that we had some time ago. It's going to be an ongoing issue. So there are a few things that I want to talk about today that uh, law enforcement agencies can do. Training is one of them. More and ongoing. Uh, the Canadian Police College is now offering a 10-day course in, in cybercrime investigations, and, and that is really important. Um, we had a call from a smaller law enforcement agency some time ago, and to quote, he says, we don't have a clue about this stuff. We don't know what to do. So I think agencies need to be trained in this. And I think all officers need to have a basic understanding of technology and how that technology uh, can be used for their investigations. You know, there is more computing power in my phone now um, that I can use as an investigator than ever before. There are lots of apps and there are lots of things that I can do with technology. And also I think investigators need to have a basic understanding as to what sort of evidence is contained on technology. I know a, um, an investigator in, in Europe who, who runs a team of investigators and he says he won't hire anybody on his team that doesn't have a basic understanding as to how they can use technology. I also know somebody that runs a Bitcoin ATM business and has numerous Bitcoin ATMs. And as you are, I'm sure are well aware, there are numerous frauds being committed right now with Bitcoin and victims are having to go up and pretend like they're paying the CRA with Bitcoin. Well, he gets calls almost daily from law enforcement saying, how do we get that money back? And he says, you can't, it's gone. And a lot of the law enforcement people he speaks to, they don't have a clue how Bitcoin works. So I think that, again, there needs to be some ongoing training under that. One of the other reasons uh, for ongoing training is never before um, in policing has there been so much changes in where the evidence resides. You know, for example, there's been eight main uh, Microsoft operating system changes, 18 for, for Macs, 10 for iPhones, 14 for Android. It's constantly changing. And as an investigator, you need to constantly be aware um, in those changes. We also have apps, more and more apps that people are using that can encrypt your data, that can have um, encrypted chats, very free, uh, free to do. Um, there are programs out there that you can set up whole fake uh, personas. Pseudo app is one that I use all the time. You can get a phone number and an email and a fake persona for free. And you can use that phone number to make calls and it doesn't come back to anything. So it's very easy some, for somebody now to use apps as part of their crime. Internet of Things. By 2020, it is estimated there are going to be 200 billion Internet of Things devices connected to the Internet. And as investigators, we need to understand where the evidence relies or relies on those devices and how to use that for our investigations. Because as you can see here, you know, they are now being relied upon in court. Traditionally, training was only offered uh, to forensically analyze devices, computers and, and mobile devices. But currently, there are training courses solely for vehicle forensics, cloud forensics, social media forensics, and, and more. As new devices, you know, such as wearables, uh, glasses, thermostats, uh, smart home appliances uh, come into the marketplace, investigators need to be trained in the methodologies and best practices uh, for evidence collection, the analysis and reporting on those devices. As you can see here, there's just a few examples of the specialties involved to investigate cyber crimes. No longer can people be a jack of all trades. It's sometimes beneficial to have people that are specialists in malware analysis, memory forensics, network forensics, device forensics, and cloud forensics. Each one of these is a specialty in itself. Staff. 
One thing that I see happening more and more, which I think is a great initiative, is hiring civilians to do a lot of this work. I teach a fourth year digital forensic course at the University of Toronto, and a lot of my students would really like to go work for the police. But right now, a lot of them can't because they don't want to go and be a police officer. They don't want to go and, and work on the road for their first few years and then try to make their way into the tech crimes unit. These are very, very smart students that have their undergrad in cybersecurity and digital forensics. And they would like to go work for the police, but they're going elsewhere because there is no choice. So I think police really need to think about civilianizing a lot of the roles within their units and hiring a lot of these, these young people on. Longer tenures for sworn officers. I know in the unit that I worked in, uh, there was a tenure for a while. And this field, as I've said, there's a lot of training involved and it's ongoing. And it takes you some years to get to be an expert. So it's a shame that after years of becoming an expert that a lot of times they will leave and, and go elsewhere. We also have to incentivize people to move to, the, uh, to work for law enforcement. I know some of my students that we've uh, helped land jobs in the private industry have left their undergrads uh, almost making $100,000 leaving their undergrad. And a Robert Half study uh, says that the average in Canada uh, data security analyst uh, salaries are now between $110,000 and $162,000. Well, that's a draw for a lot of people leaving university, obviously. So there needs to be some sort of incentivization for civilians going to work for the law enforcement. So the retention of people as well. Partnerships. Law enforcement agencies need to develop uh, partnerships with not only private industries, but also other law enforcement agencies. When, and back in, I think, 2011, when I was in tech crimes, I formed a think tank with uh, people working in the private industry from PricewaterhouseCoopers, De Deloitte, um, uh, Grant Thornton, Ernst Young, and we met quarterly. And they all came to the police department and we all met quarterly just to talk about challenges in the industry and how we can all help each other. I opened that think tank to anybody else in the police that wanted to join and I had nobody else interested. They didn't see the value of it. So I think sometimes egos need to be put in check uh, to show that there are also those out in the pr uh, private realm that can assist law enforcement investigations. I am very happy to see now that uh, that CPC course is being initiated and it does, uh, one of the focuses of it is the collaboration with other agencies and within the private sector. Law enforcement agencies need to also speak to each other. Um, I know in Technological Crimes Unit, they are sitting on a ton of data that can be analyzed and shared with other units. Often um, investigations work in little silos and they don't share collaboratively with other places. So just to recap very quickly, some of the challenges that law enforcement have are these large scale worldwide investigations. They are very time consuming for often a very low victimization amount. Sometimes $1,000 can take a lot of time. The internet of things, cloud and encryption will be larger challenges. And what can we do? Focus training for some and generic training for others. Civilianizing and incentivizing um, civilians to come into the, uh, to, to work partnerships with others to share information. And the one thing that I think law enforcement also needs to focus on is informing the public. The public looks to law enforcement as you know, the, the providers of information on crime prevention. And cybercrime is, is a big issue right now. And I see different law enforcements tweeting out different things. And I don't see a lot of them focusing on personal cybersecurity for individuals or companies. So I think they can do a much better job of getting that information out. So this was a very quick, uh, high-level view of some of the challenges, and um, in 20 minutes it's hard to, to dive deep into it. But if you have any questions, I will be around for the rest of the day, or you can feel free to, uh, to, to email me or reach out on social media. I'd be happy to chat anytime. Thank you.